All right, all right. Welcome everybody to another live episode of Building Modular. Jennifer, this is episode 19. Can you believe it? Episode 19. And we have a special guest today. We do, we do. We're so excited to welcome Mike Haney from Westchester Modular Homes. Yeah. Welcome, Hi. Mike. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. We were just talking off screen that, hey, listen, if you see people walking behind Mike or giving them rabbit ears, it's just all in the day of uh, the factory at Westchester Modular Homes. So, you know, this is going to be a great show, Mike, as we were talking about, and we're so happy we have you on because uh, you are a big, big part of Westchester Modular Homes when it comes to the delivery, the transportation, setting modules, coordinating the teams for the set, uh, and the logistics on site. So we're really looking forward to having this conversation. And I know a lot of people are going to tune in to hear what you guys have to say. And uh, I don't know. What do you think, Jennifer? Yeah. So, Mike, just so you know, we are live on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. Three locations. And yeah. um, hopefully, uh, you know, your team is out there liking and sharing this. That would be super great. Um, but yep. essentially what we're trying to do is invite um, people to join us in offsite construction. You know, when you That's think right. about modular, volumetric, offsite construction, right. industrialized construction, you know, the, the many names that we, we come by. Um, at the end of the day, we're looking right. to help all builders build it better. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And there's a lot of names, you know, Mike, one of the things on the show, you know, I know you're out there busy busting your butt on all these houses, you guys, and commercial projects that you're setting. But, you know, uh, we got Dr. Mussin on and, and George Ryman and some other folks. We have an identity crisis. Who would have thought? Are we are we offsite construction? Are we modular? Are we volumetric? Are we industrialized construction? So it'll be interesting at the end of the show. I'm going to ask you what you think we should be as far as the industry goes, modular, volumetric, what have you. So where do we want to start, Jen? Yeah. So, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, yeah. you know, your background, your experience, and, and you know, talk about what we're going to share with everybody today. Okay. Um, well, when I started um, in 86, um, I started for a stick builder, and I worked there temporarily. This was out of high school. And then I went into building log homes for two years um, from turnkey, from the foundation up. And then in 88, I went into modular home building, um, worked in the factory, uh, fabricating the modules, uh, done many aspects there with roofing and trim work. And I <clears throat> run a set crew for several years. I became production manager, um, customer service manager. Right now at Westchester, I am um, customer service manager and also uh, set manager for all of the set crews that we have. Um, so I've been in, you know, a little over 30 years mm -hmm. in just the modular aspect. I've done turnkey. I've done modular myself as a builder. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I think a lot of stick builders, you know, we welcome them. And I think they still have, a, you know, misconception of what modulars are from the old days when they're double wide trailers to now they're custom, you know, custom home built. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Not, not on this channel. I'm telling you what, if there's a stick builder that's on this channel and they don't know what we're talking about, which is a better way to build, uh, we can't keep doing things the old fashioned way, Mike. I think what's so awesome uh, about your experience is you are living and breathing this in the field every day. You're not sitting behind a camera like we are doing these things. You're actually out there dealing with all the site conditions and, and what have you. And what's even more important is, like you said, I mean, you kind of grew up in the industry. You've, you've, you've swept the floors all the way up to production manager and running the set crews and the field crews. So you understand the big picture. And I think that's what's going to be so valuable in this conversation with everybody. There's no fluff here. It's just this is how it's done. And we're looking forward to getting into this with you. Yeah, great. Yep. Yeah, and another thing that sets Westchester Modular apart is um, the fact that you offer such amazing builder training. Um, that yep. you actually have a, or, or I shouldn't say actually, but you offer a program for builders where you walk them through, um, you know, what's required and and how we're a little bit different than traditional site builders. Yeah, and we help them. Yeah, you know, from the set process, we help them in sales and engineering. Um, we help them with marketing. Yeah. Um, so it's not just you know the setting part of it, but we help them with the designing and the marketing and help them grow their own business as well. 
Right. And yeah, right. Well, they do. You know, it's funny. I spoke with John about that. You really do. You guys have a whole marketing department that helps manage the influx of information coming in for builders. So you're providing builders with leads, so to speak, is what you're saying. Correct. But right. I, I cut yeah, I cut her no, off all the time. I, People get used to it. <laughs> um, and then just in terms of the regions that you serve and, and where you're located. Yeah. Uh, we're located in Wingdale, New York. Um, we service areas from Pennsylvania all the way up to Maine. So basically the whole, you know, New England area we, we deal with. Sure. Yeah, and a quick look at your Facebook um, page tells us that you're very busy right now. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We've been uh, pretty much for 30 years, we've been building straight through um, mm -hmm. yeah. and doing very well. You know, we're almost at 8,000 houses and uh, wow. going strong. Yeah. That's love amazing. it. Love it. Love it. All right. So he's a busy man, Jennifer. Did you not hear him? He's I like, come know. on, let's get on with this already. Hey, Mike, it's okay. Everybody else yells at her. You can yell at her. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. All right. Well, let's jump in because it's a great presentation today. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get into it. Yeah. I just got to figure out how to do it first. Well, <laughs> all right. So today we're going to talk about pairing, uh, preparing for the module installation, basically the set today. All right. So listen, everybody, if you're out there, hit that like, hit that share button, please share it on your profile so other people join us and start learning. And also let's talk uh, questions and comments here. This is your chance to ask somebody who does this for a living, things that you should be paying attention to and things that you shouldn't be paying attention to, right? Or what are the problems? Because it's not all roses. And I think Mike will, Mike will tell you that as well. So with that said, I'm going to stop uh, running running my yapper here and we're going to jump right into it. So first, uh, first slide is going to be pre-delivery checklist and coordination. Tell, tell us a little bit about how the process starts for, for you. Like where, where does it start for the pre-delivery and checklist? Before you design something or after it's built? Um, well, in the beginning, uh, when you want to do a modular, you want to make sure you can get a modular to your set, to your site. Um, you want to make sure the lot can accommodate a crane, um, a modular you know, with a truck on it. Um, a lot of times nowadays, the site is so small and so tight because property is limited. Um, there are times where the crane is actually set on the street and you're picking modules up from the, from the street right off the truck because uh, you know, space is limited. Um, sometimes you're going over electrical wires, which you know, now you have to get the power company involved. So you want to look at your site, look at your surroundings, make sure you can get the module there. Um, sometimes there's tight turns that you might not be able to get through. Um, so you always want somebody to come look at your site prior to ordering a house because you don't want to get a house and not be able to get it there for one. Right. Um, and then once you know, <laughs> that is all good, and then you can get you know into the process of designing. Once you get the house ma manufactured from the module company, um, you know at Westchester <clears throat> we do a builder training course, um, which helps the builders understand you know their scope of work and what. The factory does as far as you know getting the modulars there um getting them on site help the builder basically prep for the set um get everything up as far as scheduling with the set crew the trucks um the permits um so we require a transportation checklist first um, which the builder fills out he tells us and it gives us like an outline of his site conditions um, make sure he's prepped for the delivery as far as like set crew um, preparation, like lolly columns, sill plates, uh, things like that have to be done prior to us showing up. Yeah. Uh, so his foundation will be done, the sill plates will be on, his foundation will be backfilled, um, getting ready for the crane and the modulars to show up. So he does the checklist first. Um, he sends it back to us. We confirm everything is ready. Um, we order the, the permits. Uh, some permits may require a a police escort if they're over with. Um, sometimes they do night runs, um, depending on the area that they're going to. Uh, I know Long Island, a lot of times we have to do a night run because we can't run uh, on the island during the day. So sometimes, you know, you're getting a delivery at one, two in the morning and the builder has to be there to accept the delivery. So, you know, things like that you have to think about also um, with the logistics of the delivery. Um, and yeah. checking the modules when they when they show up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's 
a whole a whole lot there to unpack, you know. And when you think about, you know, let's just think about um, the the critical points that you shared with us. Number one, you want to check out the site before you start designing the home to make sure that you know what you're designing can actually get there. Um, and number two, on the day of the installation or prior to installation, you need to figure out legally if there are any um, regulations that you need to follow as it relates to transportation or um, something we bumped into in Long Island was a noise ordinance um, that we needed to pay yeah. attention to because the trucks were coming in late at night. So. Um, you know, these are some of the things that we just need to pay attention to that might be a little bit different for offsite construction than traditional site built construction. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So pre-delivery, that's kind of the checklist. Like, what are we doing? What are we designing? We have to design something that works for the lot, right? We have to design something that we can transport there because that also plays part in this sometimes, especially tight turns. You know, you may need to design in 40 foot modules versus, you know, 60 foot modules or what have you, 30 and 30. Um, so let's, let's hop into, is this where we need to be directions and right? Yeah. Go. So let's talk about the foundation for a minute. Um, let's go here because there is quite a bit of detail here. And again, this is, this is, a, you know, in terms of questions that we're asked constantly, it's, it's, a, how does this all come together? Yeah. What does the foundation contractor really need to be paying attention to? And, um, how does this relate to the crane and the size of the crane? So, um, you know, first maybe we talk about the crane size um, and then how we're preparing the site. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, I think I think even that, I mean, what's different with uh, you guys, Mike, is uh, you have your own crane. As a factory, you have your own crane and you deliver up to a certain radius, whatever that may be, 50 miles, 60 yeah, miles, right? Um, so that's a little bit different than most. Most people are outsourcing their crane usage when they're building modular that are outside of your territory or a competitor mm -hmm. of yours. So, you know, interestingly enough, I think this would uh, this is this would be very interesting. Let's let's talk about the site logistics. What needs to, how do you prep it? What, do you, what are you looking at when you say, hey, house is coming off production line. What do we do now? So what the builder needs to do on site is he wants to make sure he's got roughly a 30 foot by 50 foot area for the crane to set up. Um, so whether it's on the property or off property, like on the street, um, sometimes you might have to shut the street down um, for a period of time for him to set the house if it's gonna be on the street or if the houses are gonna block the road. So he wants to make sure he has ample room for the crane for one. Um, we always suggest if he's not using our crane, which is in a 50 mile radius, um, he needs to have the crane company come look at this, the site conditions um, and get their input as far as where they're gonna be able to set up and what their thoughts are as far as, you know where they're gonna pick the module off of the trailer um, from either on the street or if they have enough room to get on the property. Um, make sure the foundation is backfilled. <clears throat> I know some builders nowadays use um, superior wall foundations, which you can't backfill until the weight of the house is on it. Right. So that plays right. a part in the crane as well because now the crane can't get as close to, to the foundation because you have a trench there. Um, so the further away the crane is from the foundation, the larger tonnage you're going to need in order for him to reach the foundation. Um, yeah. So for, for people to understand, you know, in superior walls, because I know they're, they're, they're pretty common in our neck of the woods. I don't think they're common everywhere. Uh, one of the things is with the precast concrete foundations is they are gravity. If they're like they're a gravity fed system, they sit on a bed of uh, a foundation of stone, so to speak. They're very great. I love I love superior walls. The system itself is a great system. Uh, George Ryman's going to argue me on something else. I see he's asking where Shorefoot is. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, because it's a gravity fed system, you got to lock it together when you set the house on top and then you can backfill so you don't push on those walls because dirt, you know, all that tonnage weighs in. And I think that's what you're saying, which means now the crane, instead of being able to put it out, put its outriggers up against the foundation wall or close to it, now has to be offset another five, six feet back which then affects boom length, boom reach, and could affect the, the size crane you need to actually set those modules, correct? Correct, yep. And you wanna make sure even if you're doing a poured foundation, you don't wanna over dig too much on the foundation because you wanna keep that crane on virgin soil as much as possible. Right. If it's on backfill, a lot of times the outriggers may sink a little bit. Um, you know, so you wanna keep them you know, back on nice hard soil. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so that brings up, yeah. yeah, so this is a great diagram that, that Oops, no, it's okay. You can keep that off for a second. Um, but one of the points that you call out too is the placement of the crane hat needs to be perpendicular to the home. So that's something, you know, when you're talking about that virgin soil and you're preparing the site, um, it's, it's not just the size of the pad, it's also the location of the pad and, and its relation to the home. Um, so that's something. And then a couple of things that you could bump into, obviously, is, is you know, right now we have a big storm coming, right? Yep. <laughs> ah, do we ever, right? Big storm coming. Yeah. So, so, so what's happening with Westchester right now for any houses that, that were supposed to be set this week? Um, well, we were supposed to set one today, um, which because of the rain, we postponed it. Um, fortunately, the house that we're doing today is um, the set crew has their own crane. Um, so the set crew that is authorized by us actually has their own crane. So they're rescheduling for tomorrow and they have that availability. Um, uh, many other areas, this is the crane and the set crew aren't the same company. So that right. a little more logistics of scheduling. Um, if you need a toter from us to move the module, so we have to make sure we have a truck available. Um, so it gets a little, a little more right. stickier on rescheduling. Um, you know, for a day or two out. Sure. Right. So let's, how about this? I, I have a, I have a brilliant idea. Brilliant <laughs> idea, Mike. You, you, brilliant. Let, let, let's, let's do some shout outs to everybody. And then what I really want to do, cause I think there's so much to unpack from that mind of yours. I want to go through step by step in our, in our process, because one of the big things that we talk about on this show all the time is checklists process, process, process. Yeah. Modular construction only works is if you follow the process, right? right? And I think that's kind of a big thing because there's so many things to think about and talk about that mm -hmm. if you don't have this checklist, it, it's going to throw everybody everybody for a loop. So with that said, let's hop in. We got George Ryman calling in from hot Phoenix, Arizona. He's the one that's busting our chops on the Shorefoot Foundations. Uh, you, know what the, you know what a Shorefoot Foundation is? Um, not necessarily, no. It, so it's a, George, if I get it wrong, we'll figure it out. But it's a pin foundation. So think about a bunch of pixie sticks, like metal tubes that go in cross angles into the ground. So you don't need traditional footers. Okay. And so all this is actually fed the way that way everything sticks. I'd have to show you a picture, but it's a really neat system. Uh, and, and you just put them in. It doesn't matter if the ground's level or not. You can level it out, requires very little if no excavation whatsoever. And they can hold everything all the way up through commercial buildings. So they're strong as strong can be. So, and I also believe they go installation times a day, day and a half with no excavation, depending on the size. German, George, I know you're going to chime in. You can chime in. I, I <laughs> plug it as best I could plug it. All right. So we have David Graham. Good morning from Phoenix. What's happening, David? Thanks for joining us this morning. We got Dr. Brent Musson. Good morning, Cooper. So Dr. Musson is great. He's out in he's out in LA, uh, and they have a modular volumetric assembly line plant. So they do things a little bit differently, where they're they're actually using the community to outsource and build each section of the house, and then on their production line, it's more of an assembly line. They're not cutting the wooden framing. That's built elsewhere. They're bringing it all in, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how they're moving down the road. Oh, uh, John, John, if you ever met a character, this is a character yeah, right here hello from Chicago land. Uh, New Gravity Housing Conference is happening out there in yep. Chicago. So if you're in Philadelphia, into, oh, yeah, Philly. Philadelphia, Why, I think Chicago, because everybody's yeah. from Phil or Chicago. Oh, yeah, that's right. The whole the whole contingency. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's all about passive house and, and really a great um, event. So, Very much so. Yeah. Mark Willie, Mark Bare Naked Willie is on the show on Fridays. We talk all about building science, Mike. So. Um, there you go. Anthony Gouday. He's down in Jersey. You guys do quite a bit of work in Jersey. Yes. Uh, he, he said power just went out. Luckily, all charged up here in New Jersey. All right, Anthony, way to be prepared. Boy Scout right there. Right. All right. We got Joel Hutchins. Good morning from Sydney, Australia. What's happening, Joel? Joel, are you still in quarantine? He flew home, Mike. They have him locked up in a hotel with military outside of his uh, room. He's not even allowed in the courtyard. Wow. I say it every show. Joel said prisoners get more privileges. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, the quarantine, 14 days. Yeah, so Joel is launching a new product, Revaya, um, with 
you know, basically offering a design solution, a, a software solution for yeah. volumetric construction. So we're very much looking forward to the launch of that product. We'll yeah, really it's, cool. it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And I'm sure you guys will take a look at it as well. So for sure. Then you, do you know Tiffany McCall? Tiffany McCall? She's the um, head of the Building Systems Council with Chair the, of the BSC. NAHB and yeah. have a big event coming up in September. Thank you for joining us, Tiffany. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Jude's with us. Hey, Jude. Good to see you. Another Chicago person. We got Andrew uh, Seely. No, no fluff. fluff. No fluff today. Look, he put, right he's in. showing the muscles. Jen, do you see the muscles? I think he, yeah. Oh, that was his muscle. It's not mine. Yeah, he's, he's right. flexing for us. Thank you. Tiffany has a question. Do municipalities need to allow installation of modular when cranes need to be set up on streets? Uh, yes, they, they do. Um, they have to get a permit because um, you don't know if there's underlying utilities or water mm -hmm. lines. Right. We got to make sure that you know, the cranes outriggers aren't going to be pushing down on them. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Listen, so we'll get to some more comments and questions here in a minute. Let's hop back into this presentation. Uh, I want to go through piece by piece because I really don't want anybody to miss anything. This just rambles off your mind like it's, you know, second nature because <laughs> it is. Um, but we really want to educate uh, what we have going on. Oh, Tiffany, I'm going to have to take you off the screen. Sorry. So there we go. Oh, got that on the screen too. Let me get that off the screen real quick. All right. So we talked about how important the dates are because we're all striving for dates, correct? Yeah. Um, and, and meeting those dates, whether it is, you know, I mean, there's several dates. Let's talk about them. So what do we have coming off the production line date, correct? Yep. You have the actual uh, start production line date. You have the off production line date, um, delivery date. You have the set date. Um, and that's pretty much the, the main dates you have to concern yourself about. Right. So and once we have those dates, then we get into the actual crane company, right? Who's doing it? Is it your, is like for you guys, if it's within 50 miles, you do it. But then again, you do a lot of work outside of 50 miles. So then you're also working with other crane companies. Correct. Yep. So outside the 50 miles, uh, the crane company is hired by the builder. Um, yep. We suggest crane companies if asked, you know, we can tell them who we recommend. Um, <clears throat> but they will see who's in their area because you want to limit your travel time for your crane also. Yeah. Um, a lot of times crane companies are port to port. So you don't want a, a crane traveling two hours to your site and two hours home because now you're only getting four hours on site. Um, so, you know, some have day rates and some have port to port. So you got to watch mm -hmm. as far as how they bill you um, because, you know, four hours in, you're going to be hitting overtime. Well, I mean, that's just it. So everybody has to understand that it may say eight hours on there, but if two, if four of those hours are driving, you're still paying for them just to be driving. Correct. So love it. Love it. And then also a uh, payment terms, right? There's dates with payment terms because we're always dealing with finances for the most part, banks, some people are cash customers, but. Yeah. And um, a lot of times we do a uh, sign of funds. Right. Um, means we get paid on delivery. So once the house is delivered to the site, um, the bank, you know, wires us the, the funds. Um, on occasion, yeah. we'll have a bank that will pay us once the house is set on the foundation. Um, you know, so those are two of the main ways we get paid. So we actually have a question that came up from Dwayne um, Barney, residential construction. Are bank draws still an issue in regard to delivery and installation? Um, it sounds like, you know, um, you probably have banks that you work with that you're familiar with and, and they're familiar with your process. Have you bumped into this at all? Um, not that often, um, more so now. Um, back in the day, it was a little more complicated, but now it, it's pretty easy. It's a pretty good um, flowing method. You're yeah. more comfortable of how the process is. Um, so a lot of banks are more on board now. Yeah. Right, and, right. and a lot of banks actually like um, offsite construction, modular construction, because it's it's more of a complete home once that financial transaction happens. Yeah. There's more equity on site um, once they, you know, they exchange that that um, uh, loan, if you will. Um, they don't have as many draws throughout the process. It's, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, their money's more secure, right? They're dealing with a company. How many years Westchester been in business now? Yeah, we've been over 30 years. Been over here. 30 years. And and so now a bank is dealing with a manufacturer and they're only given a small percentage of which totally due on the house for the production. 
right? But then there's the curbside funding portion of this, right? right? Or there's a letter of intent. So, you know, a lot of banks, and this is becoming a big thing, there's even seminars and things that are coming about now where banks are having a convention, so to speak, to learn about offsite construction and how to lend it and what the, what, what the rules of engagement are. And I always tell everybody out there as well, if you're listening, just because they're a bank doesn't mean you have to play by their rules. Right. You can negotiate with the banks, the payment terms. Everybody always wants what they want. So if you're a homeowner watching this, uh, you know, or what have you, remember that banks are negotiable. And if they don't want to negotiate, give me a call. There's plenty of other banks. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. That's my soapbox banks. Uh, sometimes, you know, they can make things easy or they can make them difficult. All right. So we got through the payment terms. So now site preparation, things that we've already looked at in the pre-design process, would be, is there overhead wires? And if there are, how are we dealing with them, right? Yeah. You know, so, yeah, wires, depending on the power company and what you have on site <clears throat> or in front of your site, you know, if they're high tension power lines, um, sometimes you have to have power disconnected. Uh, some power companies will put sleeves over them so you don't get that electrical current. Um, you know, some companies want to take them down and disconnect them. Um, it all depends right. on your site conditions, um, where the module is going to be versus the crane and the foundation. Uh, tree limbs are a big concern, uh, especially, you know, entering the site. Sometimes you don't want to, you know, hit the module on the way in. Um, you don't want to damage the roof or some windows. Um, and you want to make sure you have room for the boom, uh, the cables uh, for the crane for when he hooks up. So you, you don't want limbs over your foundation either. Um, so it's not just the entrance to your driveway or your site. Um, it's also over the foundation uh, because the crane is going to be operating over your foundation as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, so that I mean, that's part of the, you know, the logistics of transportation as well. There's there's per permits and coming down the highway, which we'll get into. But you're absolutely right. Pulling into these sites, you know, the trees scratching down the side of a house can tear up your AZEC, can tear up the vinyl, can tear, you know, scratch the window. I mean, there's just so many things that happens with it. It could rip the house wrap and nobody knows it from above, right? Unless people do their job and check. Um, so let's talk about that. So we, we, we get to where we need to go. Staging. How important is a staging area for, for this whole set? Uh, it's important because <clears throat> you, you need to know what the first module is that you need. Uh, depending on your site, where the crane's set up. Uh, sometimes the crane is on the, on the gable end of the house. Sometimes it's in the rear of the house. We prefer it to be in the front. Um, but depending on where that crane is set up depends on which module you want first. So you always want to start furthest from the crane. So if you're in the front of the house you know, with the crane, you want to start with the rear box. Um, and then the second box would be the, the box in front of that and work your way towards right. it. Um, so and once in a blue moon, we'll have a crane in the back and then you have to start with the front box. Um, but you want to stage them. So you're in order. You don't want to be scrambling the day of the set, moving boxes around and having to get the one that's in the back because you need that first. And that's all time. Um, you know, time is money yeah. during the set. Uh, you have the set crew and the crane there. So, you know, even the set crew can charge you downtime if the site's not prepped and they're all standing around waiting. So you don't want to get downtime for the set crew or the crane because um, that's just money out of your pocket um, that you didn't account for. So when you guys deliver and, and, and from the factory, are you delivering in, in the order of staging? Does it go that deep with you or is it you organize them once on location? Um, we do ask the builder you know, what order he needs them in, depending on where the crane is set up. Um, us being in the factory, we don't always know what the site conditions are or what order he needs. So if he tells us what order he needs them, we'll ship them in reverse order. So that way the first one that shows up will be the last one he needs. Yep. And that way, you know, the, the first one's in the front of, of the order. All right. So when you think about the sequence of things, this is just <clears> a really <throat> important point. If you're staging off site and hopefully you don't have to, hopefully you have enough room on site because, um, you know, that way you don't have to shuttle anything back and forth, but the modules that you're setting last should actually be staged first in the furthest point of the staging yeah. location so that the very first module that's being picked or lifted or set 
um, is the first one to come out of that staging area. So again, you know, if you're new to offsite construction, this is just something uh, to pay attention to. It makes perfect sense, but when you have so much to coordinate, this is where yeah, checklists yeah. and, and um, you know, reminders come into play. Yeah, and, and so here's a question even with that. If you do have to stage because you build in a lot of high density areas through Connecticut, Jersey, New York, right outside of the Manhattan suburbs, right? Um, and so even my past experience, a lot of times you cannot stage on the property. They're, the lots just aren't big enough. Is there a certain distance you want the staging to be no further than when you're doing your sets? Is it a mile? Is it two miles? Is there some sort of parameter? Yeah, we, we asked for within a mile. Um, if possible, you know, yep. if you have a shopping plaza or sometimes a fire department or a church will allow you to, to put them there for overnight, um, you know, not for a week or two, but, you know, a lot of times we deliver the day before the set. So you're there for a day. Right. Um, so we try to get within a mile. If it's over that, um, you know, we, we require um, escort cars because um, you're going to need that to get the modules to the site. Um, depending on the area, you might even need police escort. Right. Um, so you definitely want to make sure, you know, in that holding area, it, as close to the site as possible, yep. um, limit that traffic. And traffic is a big concern also, because if you have tight roads and busy streets, you know, you have to stop traffic to get those modules down the road. Yeah, you guys just said something in New Canaan, which I imagine required some of this. Connecticut, New Canaan, um, Connecticut. Right. Yep. Lo you know, logistical work when you think about, I mean, some of those lots are very big, but yeah. talk about traffic. Well, getting there, right? Coming across 84, you know, coming down 95. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are some of the busiest highways in the, in the country. Um, you know, something else, though, uh, you know, with the staging pro tip, by the way, well, here's my pro tip. My pro tip is if you have to find a staging area, and the closest thing to you is a church. Try not to schedule your deliveries on a Saturday because they're not going to let you take up the church parking lot on a Sunday. Right. And a lot of churches will let you use their parking lot for a small donation. Correct. You know, so it's just, you know, which is fine. You know, it's, it's their lot. But uh, same thing with uh, grocery stores during the week is better than staging over weekends. And I think people just need to understand them. Uh, understand that. Yeah. My pro tip, sorry. Thank you. Um, one, of, one of the other things though, is I think is uh, important to talk about when we talk about flag cars, we talk about police escort, let's talk about the logistics because I do know because we're in Connecticut and we've built a lot of homes through the years up in the Northeast here, that logistics transporting super wide or carriers from New York through Connecticut, you know, this is just an example, it, it takes coordination. You just don't get on a permit and get on the highway and go. There's certain times you can travel, certain times you can deliver. Walk, walk us through some of the things you guys have to really look at when you're scheduling transportation for a modular unit. Uh, it depends on you know, the mileage that you have to go to, um, the location. Uh, like I said, Long Island is you know, night travel, so we have to go down there in the middle of the night. Um, Massachusetts and Connecticut also has their time frame windows um, for transportation, especially for super wides. Uh, regular module widths aren't as you know strict, but when you get into these 16 wides, um, you have police escorts and you have time frames right. that you can travel through. So mm -hmm. sometimes you're going through a state at a certain time, and then you have to wait until the next window is for the next state. Um, yeah. Sometimes you have some downtime there. Um, so it, it gets a little tricky trying to go from state to state. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got something to say. Go, go. <laughs> Logistic wise, if you're talking about the New York to Connecticut transportation where you can't, you can travel in New York up to 11 o'clock, but you cannot enter the state of Connecticut until after midnight. I don't know. If, has that changed? Um, with Connecticut? Yeah, we yeah. can go uh, during the day. Um, even with super wides, yeah, um, super wides, yeah, but you, you gotta, you can't go during rush hours, um, because it's just way too many vehicles, you know, out on the, on the road. Um, but they do allow, uh, with police escorts at certain times. Um, it's all gotta be scheduled with the state, um, and with the police department. 
Perfect. Right. So now all of this, when we describe it, sounds so long, so hard, so difficult, so regulatory. What I want to remind everybody out there is that this is just a brief moment in time where logistics really matter. And there is huge time-saving advantages to yeah. the overall process. So when you think about the full cycle, the full build cycle, it's just really important to pay attention to these logistics right now and the sequencing right now. But overall, yep. you know, from start to finish, the build cycle time is condensed because you're working on site at the same time the home is being produced in the factory. Right. So, you know, for, for those of you who are new to the space, don't, you know, don't cut and run right now. There's, this is just a moment in time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. It's one day. It's one day. And that's 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 what you get all the gray hair for. Right. But when you're doing your foundation, we're fabricating the home. Um, yeah. It takes us a week to make, make the house on our production line. So in one week, start to finish, and then we ship it to your, your foundation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let, let's hop into that a little bit. Let's hop into the actual site, you know, things that people need to pay attention to. I'm going to put this up on the yeah. screen. Um, so <laughs> with the site, first thing, right, crane pad. What is a crane pad so everybody understands? It's an area of you know, the site where the crane will be set up. So it's a leveled area for the site, you know, on the site that the crane is going to set its outriggers on. Um, it's got to be firm. It's got to be sturdy because, uh, you know, there's a lot of weight going on it. Uh, right. Preferably virgin dirt or, or stone. And that's what the crane pad is, where the crane sets up. Sure. Right. Exactly. So in other words, if it's a hilly lot, you need to make uh, you need to dig out and level off an area for the crane to be able to set up. And you got to calculate for the outrigger widths and everything else, which can be what, 25 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet? Yeah, we say 30 by 50. 30 uh, by 50. 50. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So, all right, we get into that. Uh, we're showing up the foundations in. who's checking this foundation for square and level. Um, the builder uh, pre-checks everything. Yeah. When the set crew goes there, they'll they'll measure the sill plates again, um, make sure everything's square at the proper width, proper length um, to accept the module. Got it. And on site, we're going to have our lolly columns or our I beams and fit, you know, or whatever we're going to have pitch plates typically on the micro lamb. But so these things have to be on location ready because the set crew are going to use these to cut and put in place during the set other than an I-beam is typically already installed, I would imagine, yes? Correct, yep. Yeah, the, the long columns are cut by the, the set crew. Um, they'll level the floors out um, and have the long columns installed. The I-beam is generally done prior to them showing up. Love it, love it. And then is a dozer required on every job site? Uh, lolly columns? No, a bulldozer, you know, a loader, something to pull something around. We require it on delivery and, and set in case the trucks can't get on site. Um, so you have to have a big enough machine uh, to move the modules around. Uh, we do curbside delivery, um, but if the site allows, you know, we will drive them onto the site and drop them off. Right, right, for sure. All right, and then we have on here check length and width, squareness and level of the foundation, which just makes sense, right? It needs to be level. We're, we're building in much tighter mm -hmm. tolerances than a site builder. so. You know, uh, a quarter of an inch here or there really uh, transfers up to the peak of a roof real fast. Absolutely. Yep. 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 For sure. All right. And then we have on here brace pilings because everybody needs to understand we also build modules on on piers and pilings. So you're not limited to just because it's not a regular foundation, are you? No. No. Um, a lot of times on shorelines and wet areas, uh, builders will do the pilings. Um, they'll do a full perimeter around the pilings. Um, Make sure they're braced well. If you know, we've had times where builders would do three beams on pilings and with no bracing, and you know it's unsafe for the set crew and for the module um, because those beams will sway back and forth. Right. Uh, always make sure you have cross bracing and a, a full perimeter around. Yep. Sure, sure, love it, love it. All right, so we're before we move on to the next slide, let's get a few people uh, off the list here that are joining us. Etienne, what's up, man? Etienne is uh, the CEO of Sega North America. Now, what's really cool about Etienne, I, I actually uh, went to a training seminar for Sega, uh, and they do house wraps, membranes, tapes, and they have a free training program, just so if anybody at Westchester wants to learn about this, I actually learned a ton when I was up there. I went through the training myself. Etienne made me do it. No, I'm just kidding. 
he didn't make me. I wanted to, but you know what? I learned so much about it. And I have to tell you, I would never do things the way I used to do them. That's that's for darn sure. So Etienne uh, Googler, thanks for tuning in. Hi from Minneapolis. The most common delay I hear about is the foundation work. How are you ensuring the foundation is ready on your projects? Oh, we always check with the builder, make sure everything's done. If there's any delays, uh, he has to contact us, uh, especially if it's going to affect the delivery in the set. Um, there are times where the foundation is poured and the town officials won't allow them to set the module on the foundation for a certain amount of time for curing. Um, some are very you know, strict about a 28 day rule and yeah. some aren't. Um, and it depends on your mix. You know, some builders use accelerant, um, some are prefab foundations. So there's a lot of different uh, ways to go with foundations. Sure, yeah, sure. So Mike, that's definitely another pro tip because again, we're, we're, we're speaking a lot to regionality here. You know, we're, we're both in the New England territory, mid-Atlantic or uh, metro areas. Um, and we have encountered that with the foundation, you know, um, in terms of how long, you know, how much time needs to transpire after the foundation cures. So that's something if you're new to the space, you really want to check with your local code officials on whether or not there are any extenuating circumstances there, um, because we have been caught by surprise by that yeah. in the past. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. And the weather too, you know, if it's winter time versus summertime, you're going to have different curing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a good point, Jen, and I, I, I put it up on the screen. We are in the Northeast, but on Monday, we are having ProSet construction on. ProSet is a huge construction uh, in, out West, but they, they're they more in the commercial. Mid-rise, high-rise, low-rise sets of buildings, you know, a lot of steel modules and so forth. So we're going to be hitting the what's the issues on the uh, West Coast and Midwest as well as we go through this. So. Yeah. Love it. Love it. All right. We got some more stuff here. Let's see. Hey, Jenny Melman. What is happening, Jenny? Not just banks. Everything is negotiable. Just have to be creative. That I agree with 100%. All right. Dwayne Barney, are bank draws still an issue with regards to delivery and installation? So I think we covered this a little yeah. bit earlier, you know, and, and just again, going back to some of the nuances with offsite construction, in the end, the build cycle time is so much shorter. You're faster to equity. Um, you, you know, there's just so many advantages for banks, for investors, yeah. for developers, especially in the multifamily space to consider modular construction. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And this is uh, his name's not popping up, but it looks like Timothy Brown, regional sales manager at Florfolio. Can municipalities, towns, counties restrict modular build coming in the area? Some areas possibly seem to be political to protect the stick built. That I agree with. But what's your what have you seen on that, Mike? Uh, some towns uh, do limit like width um, of the modules. Um, yeah. so sometimes, you know, say you're doing a 30 foot wide module, we might have to do three 10 foot wides, um, mostly for shipping and transportation because you know some roads are narrow, narrow. Um, you got on-street parking. Um, so sometimes you have to accommodate um, for certain areas. Yeah, and I wonder also to follow up on that comment, if they're talking a little bit about, are they restrictive in the sense, uh, do they treat modular homes like uh, uh, trailer homes or HUD homes, you know, like there's some, some areas have covenants on, well, it's comes in pieces. So no, you can't do that. It's like a mobile home to them. Yeah. Yeah. Some areas, um, but they're coming around, um, you know, yeah. especially when you go into, you know, high rent districts, um, like Cape Cod and, and the, the islands and things like that, you know, they want to keep that, that presence of, you know, basically like cedar shake look and nice, you know, cottage look. Um, so when a modular comes, they kind of cringe a little bit and they want to make sure it's going to look, you know, the part for that area. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you can dress them up. Yeah, you know, they're all custom. So everything gets dressed up and, and blends in well. Listen, I, I know you guys build in some of the most wealthiest areas in the country. And, uh, you know, there's no doubt that you guys can dress up your homes. You guys do beautiful, right. beautiful, beautiful work. All right. Let's move back into this here. Mike, I told you it goes fast. Can you believe it's been 47 minutes already? I know. See? It goes fast. It goes fast. So we want to make sure we get through everything for everybody. Mike, kind of walk us through these uh, pictures from left to right and then down and over to where it looks like he's doing the uh, through bolts. Okay. Um, so the first one on the top left is a crane picking up the module. 
um, and setting it. Um, the one to the right is setting as well. As you can see, he's picking it up. Um, he's going to swing it over to the foundation. He sets furthest away from the crane. Um, and then the next module will be in between the crane and that, and that module. Um, the bolting, uh, we suggest, you know, the, the maximum is four feet um, for each bolt. Um, we tell the set crews to do every 32 inches, so it's every other bay, basically, on your typical beams. Um, mm -hmm. With microlam beams, we do every 16 inch on center, and, you know, stagger pattern. So the set crew will level off the floors and ceilings, and they'll do the through bolts um, in all those areas that are required. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how many, how many, what is that, 2 by 12s or 2 by 10s? Looks like uh, 2 by 10 floor systems. Yep. Yep. And we offer 16 on center or 12 on center um, to our builders. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, and the 12 on center is great for kitchen areas and things of that nature to help with deflection. I'm assuming that's why you're offering it. Yeah, yep. Yeah, when, nowadays you get bigger kitchens, you have granite countertops, yeah. you have a lot of weight. Um, so, yeah, we'll even do double double floor joists if they want. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. All right. So, what do we have here then? We have attaching the second floor bump outs and roof caps. Walk us through. All right. <clears throat> so, the uh, bump outs and roof caps, um, they're pre assembled roofs that we have online. Um, so, the roof's already at a, a fixed pick. Um, on the inside, it's all sheetrocked and finished. Uh, for the turret, it's our, it's a prefabbed uh, roof cap that sets on top of the turret. It gets anchored down with some straps and some lags um, once it's put in place. And then the secro will finish off the shingling on site. Yeah, I mean, I love it. Look how beautiful that turret is, by the way. It, it, it's actually really, really, I mean, that's really cool that you guys built that off site and all you're really doing is dropping it down. I'm assuming that whole thing has shingles already on it. Yes. Yep. So, except for where the straps are. Yeah. yeah. And is that an example of something that would have been shipped on its own carrier, or how does that work? Uh, yeah. So the turret will be in three sections: uh, be first floor, second floor, and then the roof. Um, so they'll be all on, on the trailer in pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Went too far. One, one back. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So then here we are. We're at the, we're at the finish of the set. You got the roof on, you got, you got uh, a lot of your house wrap already on, and I'm sure this is where Etienne and people will chime in, but let's, let's kind of talk about this a little bit. I mean, this is the same day that you put the units on, correct? Correct. Yep. So that's, that's, that's how much is done. Um, so all the modules are set. Uh, set crews finishing up the roof. Uh, you'll have some plywood seams to, to put in, the builder, that is, um, where the modules come together just to seal them up. Um, and we ship a three-foot wide roll of house wrap for him to, to tie everything in with um, that he'll tape on site. And okay. over to the right, um, you'll see the reverse gable and the turret, everything shingled. Um, the very top, the set crew is finishing up. And you know, that's the way it'll look when we leave. Everything will be shingled and, and put together. So with, with that said, is the goal to have it watertight when you leave or at least water water protected? Yeah. Um, the roof will be complete as far as watertight. Um, the sides where the seams are, um, the modules set tight together. So yep. you're not going to get a lot of weather in there. Um, we suggest to the builder to come there the next day to make sure they start buttoning up all the plywood seams um, and house wrap and get that buttoned up, you know, ASAP. Yeah. Right. So what we're looking at, I mean, is, you know, just in terms of where one crew finishes and the other begins, you're, are you saying the set crew will finish like all the shingling where the, you know, pieces come together and then it's the built, but it's the builder's responsibility to finish the, you know, the house wrap across the seams and any uh, locally installed siding. Correct. Yep. That's that's a great question, right? So, where where does your job begin and end, and where does the builder's job begin and end? Because I think it's different for all manufacturers. Uh, do you guys offer a manual on this? Do you guys have an outline of what your job is versus what their job is? Uh, we do. We have a builder's uh, policy manual, and it's, it basically gives them the steps of what they need to do once we finish the set. Um, the manual brings them through everything from engineering and sales to setting, transportation, 
uh, customer service, and and the finish and the button up. Um, right. So once they get to, you know, after the set, it'll give them the list basically of interior, exterior, you know, the tasks that they need to do and to look for uh, to get the module finished. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I mean, you guys have been doing this long enough that you really have it figured out. I know your builders are also super happy with you guys, you know. Um, so what do you got coming up next week? You got a lot of sets you got to go to? Um, we have sets every week. <laughs> yeah, usually, you know, four to five sets a week uh, on, on end. That's yeah, great. yeah. That's so great. And, you know, when you think about the sets and you think about how long you've been doing this, are there any stories that you want to share? Anything, you know, anything unusual or, or um, interesting tidbits that we haven't covered so far? Um, I mean, I think you guys hit a good point as far as, uh, you know, checklists are the most important. Um, when you do a modular, you're trying to think of everything right out of the gate. And it's very hard to keep track of everything. Um, so I think checklists are important. You can't think of everything uh, all the time. And it, it's really a, a good reference to make sure you have everything, you know, good to go um, and in order. Um, you know, just like plumbers and electricians, you want to get them in there right after the house set. Um, you know, we've had times where the drywall guy will come in and, you know, seal everything up and the plumber and electrician aren't even done yet. And now they're looking for connections and right. You got to, you know, go through the process and follow the steps. Yeah. Well, I love it. I love it. Perfect. So, I mean, this is one of the things, even when you sent us stuff or you sent us so much information to look at and with that information were these huge, you know, these checklists that you guys even have that you do because you run your builders training where you're at. And that's, uh, that's really, really important for people to understand. We we fight in this industry day in and day out to find builders or manufacturers such as yourself that are willing to teach, right? Willing to teach the builder how to be successful, willing to partner with the builder on how to do sales and, and be successful, right? And I think uh, I think you guys should be commended for that because there's not a lot of people in this industry that do that because they try and separate themselves, right? Right. We want to get the builders, you know, to have a long relationship with us. So we want to see them succeed as well. We don't want to, right. well, sell one house to them and and let them walk away. We try to help them, you know, be successful. So we're we're successful. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a partnership. We we go farther faster when we work together, right? Further faster. But yeah. Farther I faster. I'm confused, but but essentially, it's that collaboration and supporting each other, and you know that's what this show is all about. It's all about encouraging more people to embrace offsite construction for solutions to, um, you know, housing and and building yeah. new homes. And and when you think about it. Um, in regions that are highly populated and, you know, tons of traffic and tons of competition between the trades, I, offsite just seems to be such a smart solution. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Love it. Um, yeah, a long way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really has. I don't know where you guys are at out there, but it's really getting windy here yeah. in Connecticut. So if you're down at Anthony, I don't know if you're still with us, man. Hopefully it didn't blow your generator away or anything yeah. like that. Hey, we got Tom ready. Hey, what's up, Tom? Tom Reddy's with Synergy Steel. Great show, guys. Plan your work and work your plan. Absolutely. So time for the soapbox. Ready for the soapbox? Oh, my gosh. Here it comes. Every, every, listen, if you're going to do this and you want to be an offsite, it's just like Mike Heine said. It's all about checklists. It's all about pre-planning. It's the same thing Tom Reddy just said. Plan your work and work your plan because if you do that, it is going to change everything that you do. And one of the big things we push around here is precision plus performance will equal profitability. Spend your time paying attention to the precision of what you're doing, square foundations, level foundations, proper build techniques, wrapping everything up, using skilled trades to help you pull everything together. Because if you do all these things, one, you get your job done faster. Two, you're going to be more profitable. And that is the key. And I. Well, you forgot one of the most important things. What's that? Happy clients. Oh, happy clients. Right. Because guess what? Without happy clients or happy builders, you're a startup business every year. Yep. That's my soapbox. And, you know, uh, I don't know. You take a look if you get a chance. We did a hospital set with another modular manufacturer, 7,000 square, square feet, Mike, in, in hospital with all the MEPs, concrete and steel. These, you, these modules weighed between 40 and 70,000 pounds. 11 weeks they had the emergency room open. Nice. 
and that's what comes out of it. You know, you, you plan, you plan, you plan, and you can execute. And uh, you're only as good as your team. And Westchester's been around a long time. You guys make a good team for somebody. Yeah. So, Mike, how do we get a hold of you? How do yes. people get a hold of you? How about um, the best way is to go on our website at westchestermodular.com. Um, and everything will be there. Uh, depending on your area, we can refer our, one of our salesmen to you and, uh, and see what you got going on. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. You uh, just hang tight. We'll catch up with you once we're done here. Um, Jennifer, you want to take us out? Well, let's let's share with the audience what we have coming up for the rest of the week. Oh, yes. You know, silly me. Mike, see, I get, told you I start forgetting stuff. <laughs> I start forgetting stuff. So I'll put it across the ticker. It's been playing. So we have uh, Scott Bridger and team from ProSet uh, Construction coming on Monday. Wednesday, another Tuesday is Building Modular, and we'll announce what that's going to be about. Wednesday next week. This is really cool. We have somebody that's getting ready to come out of their, uh, what do they call it? pre launch yeah. Stealth mode. Stealth mode's a big thing. They're doing uh, 3D printing, house printing, 3D house printing. Uh, so we're going to have them on the show next Wednesday, the 12th at 1 p.m. So that's next week's lineup. And then Thursday, of course, we always have Miles J. Biggs, you know, Biggs ideas on increasing influence. And Friday with the none and one only Mark, the bare naked Willie. And yes, we cannot get him to stand up to see if he really is naked down there or not. But uh, Mark, don't do that. I was kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but Mike, you should join us tomorrow mm -hmm. because we have Nigel Watts. Uh, oh, coming did I even say that, didn't I? From right Rhea here. Nigel and, Watts from Rhea, right? Yeah, so Rhea is, um, again, you know, another product launch for all types of construction. Sneak peek. Yeah, sneak peek. Um, and, you know, traditional, traditional site builders, offsite construction, we should all be checking this out. I mean, it's what, 12 SKUs, you know, in terms of their. Um, it's an HVAC, HVAC system. system retrofit. It's not metal. It snaps together. It's small tubes like a high velocity system, but it is not high velocity. You do not need to be a skilled mechanical contractor to install it or figure out how much air you need to pump to each room because they've, they've developed the whole thing with an app and it's being tested you know, out on uh, out in the field as we speak. So all good. Yeah, yeah. So that's tomorrow and we have a great lineup next week. But Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Really, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the knowledge. Appreciate all the hard work you're doing out there. Thank you to John Colucci and Westchester Modular Home and everybody out there for everything you guys do. So, all right, that's it, eh? Yeah. Hey, Canada, for my Canada friends, they said, hey, <laughs> all right, hey, we're out of here. Everybody have a wonderful, uh, wonderful afternoon. Stay safe with the storm if you're on the East Coast. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock with Nigel Watts. Mike, you hang tight. Bye now. <laughs>